Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Katie Boone, and I'm the Marketing Manager for the NSF ISR Division here at NSF International. I want to thank you for joining us today for this webinar on the status update of the Occupational Health Safety Management Systems, ISO slash FDIS 45001-2008. I'd like to introduce you to our speaker today. Joy Kennison Longry uh, is our Environmental Health and Safety Business Unit Manager here at NSF. Joy graduated from the University of Washington in Seattle, where she graduated from the School of Public Health and Safety with a Master's in Public Health, a BS in Environmental Health and Safety, and a BA in Spanish. She is a licensed professional environmental engineer, registered sanitarian, certified in Arctic cold regions, and is bilingual in English and Spanish specialized expertise in the area of environmental health and safety, including utilities, transportation, air quality, asset management, greenhouse gas, slash carbon footprints, and environmental program policy, protection and compliance. Before we get started, I just want to mention a few housekeeping items. During the webinar, attendees will be placed on mute to prevent from any distractions. If you have any questions during the webinar, please use the chat function and we will answer those questions during the Q&A at the end of the session. This webinar is being recorded, and all registrants will receive an email to download a link to the webinar as well as a PDF of the slides. So I want to thank you again for joining us today and your support for NSFISR. It's really greatly appreciated. And from there, I'm going to pass it over to Joy. Thank you, Katie. Can you hear me okay? Yep, you're, uh, you're all set to go. Okay, great. And thank you to everybody who's taken your time from your very busy day to meet with us and so we can give you an update on the status of the final draft of the International Standard 45001 Occupational Health and Safety. I also wanted to thank all of you for your dedication and interest in support of occupational health and safety because it is very important to the industry, to the workers, and um, to the health and safety of um, interested, um, interested folks um, around the world and in the community. The objectives of the webinar today is to give you a quick introduction of NSF ISR, give you a status on the international standard for occupational health and safety, discuss the timing for the migration to the new standard, give you a quick highlight of some of the changes in the final draft, uh, what you can talk at a very high level of what you can do to plan to for that migration and then ask any questions and then discuss next steps. Uh, there will be an opportunity to answer questions uh, at the end of the session uh, and also if there's something burning um, you can do it through the chat uh, screen as Katie indicated prior to this. Uh, uh, many of you know NSF International. NSF International was founded in 1944. It was a spin-off from some students at the University of Michigan. Uh, initially, NSF was the National Sanitation Foundation. They, were, they did some work with the uh, photo fountains and milkshake machines to be sure they were safe. But NSF has grown ex and expanded significantly since that point of time. But we are, our global headquarters is in Ann Arbor. And uh, we are, have offices and um, locations in all around the world. And so we're very happy to be able to provide, continue to provide quality service focusing on public health and safety and sustainability. As you know, occupational health and safety is very important to the workers, to their families, to the businesses, to your industry, and to the bottom line. According to the International Organization of Standardizations out of Geneva, Switzerland, they, their research indicates that every 15 seconds a worker dies from a work-related accident, injury, or disease. And another 153 people every 15 seconds experience a work-related injury. Additionally, to me, it's really astounding that over 7,600 people die each day as a result of work-related activities, which ends up to be 370 million accidents on the job annually and, that, um, or, and over 200, almost 3 million deaths a year, which is a lot. And it's a huge burden to employers, to employees, our families, and the community. And it's just significantly um, something that it, it can be prevented and can be improved upon. And so again, thank you all for your dedication to this. 
And I'm really excited about the new international standard, 45001. It has, um, it builds on the old ASAS 18001, and it has several different focus areas. Again, looking at protecting the, the workers, the employees, contractors on site for health and safety issues. Um, it helps to meet the consumer expectations of the products, um, whether you sell them retail, hotel, or through the supply chain. Obviously, it helps your reputation, reduces injuries and illnesses, and, and helps the bottom line and the productivity and set job satisfaction of employees in your organization. If you look over at the uh, three circles in the, on the left-hand side, as you know, sustainability and sustainable development is all part of occupational health and safety and environmental health and safety and a, a number of management systems. Many of you may be aware of the ISO 14001, which is considered to be the environmental pillar of sustainability. So sustainability has three pillars, environmental, social, and economic. Some people call it people, planet, and profit. So the ISO 14001 standard is the environmental pillar. The ISO 45000 standard um, supports the social or the people pillar of sustainability. And all of these standards, of course, uh, do support the economic pillar because you do save uh, time and money and prevent a number of illnesses and injuries through these implementation of these standards. So again, this is a great new enhancement and improvement as far as continual improvement from the OSAS 18001 to the migration of the new ISO 45001. The all new international, all new standards go through an, an, a six step process, whether they're upgraded every five years or in this case, it's a new international standard. And we're calling this a migration because it is moving from a, the BSI standard OSAS 18001 to ISO 14001. As many of you know, we've been through a number of years of process of um, and continual improvement and looking at what really needs to be in the standard. And we're currently at stage Five or step five, which is the approval stage for the final draft international standard. As many of you know, the vote is in. Over 120 countries voted and 93% approved. And so we're really excited because we're getting ready for the next step. So now that the approval vote is in, what is going on is they need to translate the standard into a number of different languages. And so when the standard is actually published, and it's expected to be published in March, I don't have a specific date, we're waiting for that, uh, it will be published in multiple languages at that time. And so that's what takes the time between when the final approval is in and when the actual standard is published. As soon as it's published, we will let you know and we will again be providing you ongoing updated status as we go. Now I do have a polling question. I'd like you to um, take a moment to answer, and then we'll see, just so I get a feel as far as who our audience is and what standards they currently are using. So if you could take a moment to click the appropriate boxes, I'd appreciate it. And we can see the results here. So it looks like we're, well, Interesting. So we have a number of um, people on the participating in the webinar that are currently registered to OSAS 18001, which is good. A number in 9001 and 14000. So quality and uh, management, environmental management, and even some responsible care. So that's great. Thank you so much for your um, input and support on that. As I mentioned before, for those of you, since many of you have been involved in 9014, we call that a transition because it was transitioning from one ISO version to an updated version. For the ISO 45001, because it's a, a brand new international standard, the uh, ISO, the International Standard Organization is calling it a migration. And so uh, what that means is that ISO 45001, when it's published in March will be called ISO 45001 2018. It will replace OSAS 18001 2007. We will expect a three year migration period similar to the three year transition period we had for ISO 9001 and 14001. And at the end of that three year period, 
OSAS 18001 will be considered withdrawn, so it will no longer be a standard for either third or second party certification. The um, expiration date certificates of uh, the certificates, if you either do a surveillance or a recertification, they will be all be keyed off of the uh, actual publication date of the new standard, three years minus one day. Uh, we don't have that date yet, but I expect it to be in, in March. So the three-year period would be March, let's say it was published March 15th, then it would be uh, March 15th to March 14th, 2021 is when all of the certificates for 18,001-2007 will expire. Uh, it's important, though, to remember that if you currently are certified to 18,001, you need to maintain that certification and conformity to that certification until you have successfully completed the migration process. Um, in general, one question we often get is, when will NSF be in a position to conduct ISO 45001 audits? We, like uh, other uh, organizations that uh, provide third-party independent services for certification do need to be approved by ANAB. And so at this point in time, we are in the process of awaiting the final application form from ANAB. We have to go through that process. Uh, we need to be sure that we have auditors and uh, get ourselves trained to the new international standard requirements, which we expect to be out very, very soon. And then identify what the migration days requirements are. Ensure you are ready for that and we're ready for it. And it's, we expect we will be approved by ANAB because uh, we've successfully done the process for a number of other standards as they've upgraded. So we're confident we'll be able to be one of the first um, organizations to be able to offer the third-party verified certifications uh, end, of sec end of second quarter, like end of May, early June, um, or sooner. So that's sort of the time frame we're at. But just to remind you that you would need, obviously, um, auditors cannot be scheduled to do an audit for to 45,000 until they are qualified. And then you need to be sure that your organization has the information, um, has updated your standards, your staff have been trained, and we have some tools ready to help you for that. So just as a reminder on that. Um, again, the question we often get is when can we begin to certify the organizations? Again, we need to have our approval. We expect it in May, maybe sooner, um, and that you need to maintain your conformity to ICE to OSAS 18001 throughout the migration process. We have a number of tools that will be ready for you to support you in a smooth transition, including our web page. We'll have um, access to webinars, um, gap assessments, which are voluntary, our optional choices. We will have readiness tools, Delta checklist, and op optional toolboxes um, for our clients to assist them in that transition and migration to the new international standard. Um, the information we have, there are two IAF uh, or, um, publications that recently have been published, 21 and 22. So if you've you not gotten, you can get free, free copies of those if you go to the IAF webpage. Again, they're 21 and 22. And there's a lot of good detail there for you, so you can take a look at that. They specifically say that for migration audits, uh, they can be either single or staged approaches. It can be done during either routine surveillance at recertification or during a special audit. So we do know that right now. They've also given us guidance that there will be additional audit days required for the migration. The minimum is one day required to cover both existing and new requirements. And then uh, because each client and migra migration audit is unique, that uh, IAF and ANAF have indicated that we may need to increase above the minimum number to sufficiently demonstrate conformity to 45,001. The guidance we've received so far does not um, allow any decreases. So you're at um, the what's in the IAF uh, audit days based on risk, and then at least one additional audit day to cover the new requirements. Certification decisions once your audit has been completed. Uh, certificates cannot be issued until all um, outside your outstanding minor nonconformances have been reviewed and accepted. And then for major, just as it is right now, uh, a certificate could not be issued until the major nonconformance is reviewed, accepted, and verified. And then there's another little nuance on this. It says that records need to be available uh, to verify that any nonconformances that were in place with OSAS 18001 have been evaluated and are in conformity before uh, 
the migration to ISO 45001. So please be aware of that. I wanted to share with you, you know, what has changed and what has not changed. So in the new ISO 45001, there no longer is a mandatory requirement for a management representative. A manual is not required, and the term preventative actions has uh, been eliminated, but the concept is still there. If you look at the three circles, they're sort of like shades of, shades of blue. So what, if you're starting over on the right-hand side, far right-hand side, you can see what was in OSAS 18001. The blue circle, lighter blue circle in the middle talks about the um, areas that are still in common between OSAS 18001 and ISO 45001, but they are shades of gray. So the terms might be there, but they might be some nuances. And so the concepts are there, but improved as far as continual improvement. So I wanted you to be aware of that. As with all of the new international standards, they have taken the high level structure, the 10 uh, clause areas that you're probably all familiar with, but it does look different than OSAS 18001. But the great thing about it is that it does allow for really smooth and easy integration with 9000 and 14001. So I'm really excited about that. Some of the specific areas that have changed that I just wanted to highlight, just like in 9001 and in 14001, this new ISO 45001 has a lot of emphasis on leadership and commitment. The nuance in the leadership and commitment in ISO 45001 occupational health and safety management systems that has a lot of emphasis uh, and expectations of top management and top leadership ensuring that there's active participation and consultation with workers and workers representatives. Sometimes workers representatives are considered labor unions. So that's a, a new uh, focus um, in the top management and leadership commitment. The context of the environment is new to ISO 45001, but those of you who are familiar with uh, environmental management systems, 14001 and quality management systems, it's similar. Uh, but it talks again about internal and external issues as well as needs and expectations of workers and other interested parties. Again, emphasis on workers and their representatives where they exist. As with the other standards, risk and opportunities is a focus and continues to focus on the risks and hazards associated with occupational health and safety. As in OSAS 18001, there is, um, th there is discussion in the current standard about contracting and outsourcing, but there's a whole new section on procurement and a lot more emphasis on contractors and outsourcing and the potential impacts to ensure that there's not occupational, there's plan change and understanding and communication between procuring and contracting and outsourcing and even um, contractors coming on, on site and subcontractors. There's a lot of en enhanced focus on internal and external communications as well as emphasis on um, performance evaluation. And for those of you familiar with the other standards, it's now documented information rather than documents uh, so that it can be a variety of types of forms, whether it's electronic, uh, paper, etc. There is a crosswalk uh, associated with it, so you can see where the, before all of the actual meat of the standard was in section four of OSAS, and that has been split uh, across the 10 different clauses. I'm not gonna get into the details here, but this will be available for you to take a look at. Uh, and the uh, areas that are highlighted in light blue on the right-hand side under that final DIS, those are new sections that are not specifically called out in OSAS, OSAS 18001. Some of the concepts are like on performance evaluation, but clearly on the context of the organization and leadership and worker participation, uh, it's um, a lot more emphasis there. Also, continual improvement is an area that is going to be focused on uh, throughout the uh, life of the certificates and standard. What I was going to do now is I was going to go through and just give you a really high level as far as what's in each of the different pieces of the international standard. We're going to have another webinar next month once the standard is actually published where I'll go into a lot more detail. But I just want you to be aware because probably most of you do not have a copy of the final draft international standard. And it did change quite a bit if you had one from the draft, st the draft standards. So the, back, the introduction has quite a lot of good information about um, the background and the aim of the system and success factors. 
And so I would encourage you to take a look at that when it's published because it will be out in the published format. Specifically, it talks about why it's important and that it's the responsibility of the organization to ensure uh, that the safety and health of workers and others that can be affected by its activities uh, are, are considered and that it's an organization's responsibility to do that. And the intent is to enable an organization to provide safe and healthy workplaces, obviously prevent work-related injuries and ill health, and continually improve the occupational health and safety performance. And again, to, pro to manage risks. It's clearly called out, I think, more clearly than in the other standard. Also in the introduction, they talk about success factors, and they clearly call out the role of top management and communications and participation of workers um, in this. They also talk about ensuring that the occupational health and safety system is integrated into business processes. So you can see that also is uh, very uh, similar with some of the language, in particular on the integration uh, with the other standards if you uh, have those other standards, and it looks like a number of you do have that. So that is some of the key factors that they talk about, again, in ensuring that top management is committed to and responsible and accountable for leading and promoting a culture that supports organ occupational health and safety, and that is a key factor for success. So the fact that all of you are here, I think that's a really good indicator and we need to be sure that you, if you're not taught management, that you ensure that your taught management is aware that they have a new and enhanced role in even more so in occupational health and safety management system in the past while they've always had a role. Clause 1 talks about the scope and specifically the intended outcome as a continual improvement, etc. So that's pretty similar, but I do want to say that if you go back in the annex of the standard once it's published, always look at the annex because they actually add some words of clarification. And just as in the other standards, they talk about the credibility of your organization and your occupational health and safety management system will depend on the choices your organization makes on the boundaries. Annex also says that the scope should not be used to exclude activities, products, or services that can impact your, your occupational health and safety performance or evade legal requirements. Not that you would, but it's clearly called out in there. And then it also says that the scope needs to be factual and representative of your organization operations and that your boundaries should not be used to be used to or should not mislead interested parties. Not that you would do it, but that is what is in the annex, and so there must have been problems worldwide is what I can only assume there. Clause 3 talks about terms and definitions. I want to point you to the box on the right-hand side where it talks about terms that have been dropped, so you can see those terms have been dropped. And then in the box in the, that is green, these are new terms that are in the uh, standard. And so uh, some of them are nuances or shades of, shades of, shades of gray from old um, definitions of slight word chain, but some of them are concepts that, that were just not defined before. The other thing, as, you, as it was at least in the environmental management system, is that the, in Clause 3, the terms are arranged in a conceptual order, so they're not alphabetical. But if you go to the very back, and, and, and the annex of the standard, it is in alphabetical order, and then it tells you what clause to look at if you can't find the, the term you're looking for, the definition. So they do have that tool as well. Clause 4 talks about the context of the organization. So some of these things, again, if you're familiar with the other standards, it talks about understanding the organization and its context, needs and expectations of workers and other interested parties. It talks about defining the scope and the management system. So specifically on the understanding the context of the organization, it, the focus obviously is focused on um, those issues that can impact occupational health and safety of your organization um, and those internal and external issues that are relevant to it. And in the annex, it gives a lot of really good um, definitions and, and examples. I think the standard has the best examples as compared to ISO 9001 or 14001 because I've looked at those extensively. They also talk about understanding needs and expectations of workers and other interested parties. Um, and uh, the, the annex, again, has really good uh, definitions and examples associated with it. And then, again, determining the, the boundary and how the, understanding the context of the organization and understanding the needs and expectations of workers and other interested parties does actually need to be taken into consideration as you look at the scope of your organization and the boundary and applicability. 
So you need to go through those first two steps um, and then reaffirm that your existing scope and existing boundaries are appropriate. Uh, again, these are just some of the examples. I'm not going to get into the detail because you can take a look at it when you do have the um, standard when it's actually published. It's similar but more explicit and I think gives some really good examples in, in the annex. Same with understanding the needs and expectations of interested parties. And we will be providing an optional tool available for you that will um, help you identify these and ask some of the basic questions that you could use at least for a basis to be create to create stimulus thinking in your organization as far as how you can what you can do to um, meet the intent of this. Clause five looks at the leadership and worker participation. Again, it talks specifically about the expectations of top management and leadership and commitment. And again, there's a lot of emphasis on worker participation. It talks about the occupational health and safety policy, roles and responsibilities and accountability. And then it also talks a lot about consultation and participation of workers, which is, uh, has a lot more emphasis in, in the OSAS 18001. Uh, just as in some of the other standards, it talks about what the expectations of top management are, and there really is a st much stronger role that the international standard is expecting of top management to ensure an effective and, and occupational health and safety management system and effective outcomes that supports everybody, workers, the business, and interested parties. Clause six talks about planning, and planning talks about it takes into account actions to address risk and opportunities, and that's where your hazard identifications comes in, uh, and identification of opportunities and risks, and then your legal requirements. And then section 6.2 talks about occupational health and safety objectives and planning and how you're going to achieve those, and it's linked again back to risks and opportunities. And all of these are kind of chained back to even uh, understanding the context of your organization and the needs and interests of interested parties, um, in addition to uh, legal requirements and other commitments that your organization has, has made or will be making associated with it. Uh, this is just kind of how it's broken down as far as um, assessment of occupational health and safety risks and what those opportunities are and then determination of legal and other requirements. Clause seven talks about support, and the support talks about resources, being sure that there's adequate resources to develop, plan, implement, maintain, monitor, and, monitor, and continually improve your occupational health and safety system. It talks about competence of uh, workers and consultants and subcontractors and contractors on site. It talks about awareness associated with that, communication, and documented information. Clause eight is where a lot of the operational and planning comes in. That's where you will find you're eliminating the hazards and reducing occupational health and safety risks. The hierarchy of controls come into play here. Managing change, and this is where the procurement comes in. And so there's a whole section, subsection of this clause that talks about procurement. Uh, it talks about not only general things to can take into consideration, but also contractors and outsourcing. And like in the existing OSAS 18001, there is an important section on emergency preparedness and response. Again, many of you know and are aware of um, the hierarchy of controls. It's mentioned in OSAS 18001, and it continues to be emphasized in ISO 45001, and that is just to eliminate the hazard to begin with, you know, was the first thing, and you go through this whole process with PP, protectional, personal protective equipment as being the last option. And I know all of you are um, very aware of that, but it is, again, a key component of this international standard. Management of change is important. They talk about um, introducing new products, you know, both planned and unplanned, new products, services, and processes. And they talk about how that works with temporary workers and equipment, um, design specifications, raw materials, staffing changes, kind of all of that stuff. And so I really like this. I think it's a really good component of um, change, managing change and being aware of it and planning for it. And to also ensure that you've considered the unintended consequences associated with changes, whether it's a new product, service, equipment, et cetera, so that people uh, are protected from both a health and safety uh, 
perspective. Again, there's quite a bit of um, mention of contractors in this section, and we will be having an upcoming um, webinar talking about kinds of things that uh, can be done. In fact, if you look back into the annex, they talk about things. They have really good examples as far as what you can do to ensure contractor performance. Uh, one, being sure that the contracts are clearly defined as far as responsibilities, but things you can do proactively to ensure that you have successfully put into the system uh, methods to ensure that your contractor performance support and protect uh, health and safety uh, associated with what you're procuring, whether it's on-site or off-site. And same with outsourcing, same types of things. And so we'll be having additional information on this to help you, but I just wanted to say it is part of the standard. And also, if you look over here in the box, that talks about if you go back in the annex, they have really good examples of things to consider if you have not already considered that. So in some of your upcoming webinars, not only do we want to have be sure we have your occupational health and safety, our environmental health and safety people, but I want to say and please invite your finance or procurement folks and engineers for their specifications and some of this stuff because everybody plays a role in this. Clause 9 talks about performance. Uh, there's a lot more emphasis on performance evaluation, not only in I mean, the current standard does have that 18,001, but the new 45,001 has a lot more emphasis on that. And we've heard from ANAB that that is going to be part of what they're expecting all of the auditors to take a look at, in particular around performance evaluation, as well as continual improvement throughout the life of your organization and occupational health and safety. Uh, this is also where you have the internal audit and then a management review. In the uh, monitoring and performance, uh, there's a lot more, as in 14,001 and 9,001, they say you need to clearly identify what needs to be monitored, when it's going to be monitored, how it's going to be monitored, how you know it's valid, against what criteria are you going to be evaluating your performance against, and um, how you're going to share the results. They also talk about examples of benchmarking. And so uh, benchmark becomes a much more important concept in your progress and monitoring your progress as far as how do you know you're doing what you're doing and how do you fit into your sector or to others that are doing similar type things. So those are the kinds of things that are emphasized in this new international standard. Clause 10, the last clause, talks about improvement. Um, that's where the non-conformances comes in, but it also that's where the continual improvement come in, comes in. So some of the things are similar to the so, um, 18,001, and some just has more emphasis in it. Um, some examples of continual improvement, if you look in the box, which is actually in the annex, they talk about um, examples that your organization may have identified as far as what are some of your good pro practices. What suggestions and recommendations have interested parties given you? Is there any new technology that can be used to help uh, for occupational health and safety? Uh, what if there's new information or understanding related to either processes, products, or, or services that you do that potentially might impact workers, workers' safety and health, or uh, interested parties in the community, what have you done to incorporate that? So those are some examples as far as how you can demonstrate continual improvement. And, they, and so I think it's framed up very nicely and it gives you a little bit more certainty and predictability as far as what you can aim for and examples to focus on as you continually to improve your occupational health and safety management system. We will be having a series of upcoming webinars and communications with our for our existing clients and anybody who wants to, who's not our client but is considering um, making the very important strategic decision to have an occupational health and safety management system put in place. Once the standard is published in March, we will let you know, and then we will also have a webinar with highlights about what's changed. We'll also talk to you about um, tools to help you to migrate to it because we want to be sure this is as smooth as possible for everybody, that there's no surprises and that you know what's expected of you, and then we can get you scheduled as soon as possible for a smooth transition into the new standard. Um, I now have um, a, a question, a polling question. So if you want to take a moment to answer these questions, I'd appreciate it.
So it looks like, while well, we're still doing it, but I'm just looking at some of the live results. So I'm happy to see that some of you are, um, obviously a lot of you are not, well, some are not sure. I think integration um, is, a lot of you have indicated that, and I think it's a great opportunity. Uh, but even if you don't integrate, I think just a transition to the new standard is, is, is important. So it's an important strategic step. And not only will it protect the health and safety of the workers and interested parties, it will protect your brand and it will protect your bottom line. So question we often get is what happens if you don't make the migration by the specified date in 2021? Well, we're optimistic. You obviously are here, so we, we want to ensure and encourage and support early transition. But, if, um, but you do need to maintain your conformity to OSAS 18001 if you're currently certified to it throughout the migration process. And if the migration is not made by the expiration date, which is yet to be determined, um, then your certificate will expire, will no longer be valid. And then you will need to start over with OSAP, with ISO 45001, with a stage one and stage two. So uh, it would be like you hadn't had any certification before. So it may be a little extra, there may be extra steps as compared to doing a migration from 18,001 to 45,001. But since you're here, I suspect that you are a target audience that will not be in that situation. But I did want to share that with you. Again, when it's available, we will have uh, the standard available at our bookstore, and we will provide that link to you and notify you as soon as possible. Of course, you can always get it from other sources, such as the International Organization for Standardization in Geneva, but we'll want to be sure and help you and support you as, as you go through. We have one other question for you as far as ensuring that we're focusing and um, as, we, as we phase out our, or phase in or um, the tools, we want to be focused on the tools that you think will be most helpful for you. These tools are, for the most part, optional, but we want to ensure that you, um, we're looking at what your interests and needs are. So if you could check what, you can check more than one, I believe, and uh, let, let us know what you're interested in. For those of you who are currently certified with NSF to uh, 9,000 and 14,000, some of these are available already for some of the standards and some are not. So, great. You, um, I'm glad to see there's lots of interest in lots of these. So we are excited to help you with a smooth transition. So in summary, we've talked about what the status of the final draft of the international standard is. We've talked about the timing migration to this new standard. I've highlighted some changes in the final draft. I do want to say that because it is in a final draft, it is subject to, to change in the published documentation, but I suspect they'll just be minor, probably formatting things or typos, uh, but you never know until it's published. We've talked about what you can do to, to plan to get ready, and then we'll answer any questions. So if you have questions, we can take those now. Katie was going to um, help facilitate this, I believe. Yes, if there's any questions that you guys have, please use the chat function to do so. Um, I haven't seen any come in throughout the presentation. Okay, I have one here. Um, will NSF have any auditors ready for the new standard by May 18th? Well, that's a good question. I, um, it depends on a number of variables. It depends on, one, when the training is made available uh, by the oversight body, and we don't have that information yet and it depends on when the auditors are actually trained and get certified. So um, at this point in time, um, it, it is the, quest, the answer to be is to be determined. I think May 18th might be a little optimistic, but it might be feasible too. And if you have questions, call me offline and we can work through that and see what we can do to get some expedited auditors in place. And I will mention again that everyone that has registered for the event will receive an email with a link to download a PDF of the slides as well as a complete um, uh, video recording of the webinar. So you'll be receiving that within the week. Um, just to mention that again, in case anybody missed it at the beginning of the presentation. I don't see any other questions coming in, Joy. Maybe they'll be following up with you directly. Um, I will go back to the slide that had 
the future webinar dates on it so that everybody can see those again. Again, Joy did mention that these dates are, uh, are dependent on the release of the actual standards, so keep that in mind. Um, oh, I see we do have a, a question that came in, a customer, it seems like our, our current uh, CERT expires in April of 2020. Should we do the upgrade audit? with our research audit for 9,001, 14,001 or other standards, or would it be prudent to schedule this separately? Okay, I see kind of two questions around certification and um, how you do it. And I think each organization needs to figure out what, what works best for you. If your certificate expires in April 2020, if you are ready, and if you want it to do it integrated with your other standards, then that wouldn't make sense. Uh, but if you're it, but it depends on where you're at as an organization, and we can be flexible to meet your needs. But if you can do it, that would be great. Another question I see is, a current, if your current certificate expires in 2020, can we migrate in 2019 and maintain your current cert cycle, or do we lose a year? You actually have some options on this. You can either, um, if your current certification expires in 2020, if you migrate, if you, and it, can we migrate in 2019? Yes, you can migrate in 2019, and then depending on how you do it, if you do it as a full research, then you get three more years. Or if you do it at a, at a surveillance, then you would be on your same cycle. So you would have those choices. And we will work with you to figure out what beats your business needs. Okay. Is there well, any... Have, no, those will be on. Go ahead, Joy. Sorry, that's one of the questions I see. We will be um, posting some frequently asked questions um, too. And if you other, have other ideas or suggestions, feel free to let me know because if you have it, I'm sure others will. And to the extent that it makes sense, we want to support all of our clients to ensure that we have smooth transition and you have what you need to help you. So thank you very much and thank you for your dedication to occupational health and safety. It really does make a difference to many people, including your workers and your business in your community. Thank you everybody for joining us. And as I said, I'll be following up with uh, with Danielle. So keep an eye in your inboxes for a link to download the webinar as well as a PDF of the slides. I'd like to repeat what Joyce said and thank you all for joining us. And you guys all have a great day. Thank you.